how it's beautiful. Yeah. You will, I did not know they were going to sing that song, and I want you to keep the words of that song in mind as I come to the last point that I make. You'll think that God arranged it. <laughs> what a joy it is and an honor to be with you here today on this happy time of celebration and graduation. We've reached the end of a long and a difficult process. Take a breath. Up until now, it's been like you've been Moses on Mount Nebo, looking to the Promised Land. But now you get to be Joshua and cross into it. Some of you are starting new jobs, new careers, moving to new houses and communities, and you'll be meeting new people. There's a saying that you never get a second chance to make a first impression. And so I've made a list of seven principles that I think you can use not only in your first week of ministry, but throughout your careers. And I've gleaned these from six decades of living myself. Uh, a career practicing emergency medicine, 13 years as a Christian, because I became a Christian 13 years ago, and for the last 10 years I've been an amateur preacher. <laughs> so listen up. I well recall my first week at work. My wife, Nancy, and I had moved to the coast of Maine with our two children, and it's such an exciting time, these beginnings that you come into. And I remember one of the first patients I had on Monday morning in the emergency department, like it was yesterday. He was 91 years old. And I picked the chart up and I saw 91 and I gave a little bit of a groan because a 91 year old patient can sometimes have a very thick medical chart that you have to read through. And I learned that this gentleman had never been ill. He'd never been in the hospital at all. And I thought, this is going to be easy. And it turned out that he was the patriarch of the town. He was the head of the largest construction company in the state. And he was beloved. He had never laid an employee off seasonally. And if, unless you work construction, you don't know what a big deal that is. And his, his family adored him, and he had all these children and grandchildren the community loved him. And when his employees found out he was in the hospital, there must have been 20 dump trucks that showed up at the hospital. And, uh, and so I met him, and I understood why people loved him so much. And I ordered some labs and x-rays and went out to reassure the family we'd get to the bottom of this. And he dropped dead. Not just a little dead, either completely dead. I couldn't resuscitate him. Well, <clears throat> this was a gracious family, and the next day they took out a full-page ad in the paper. I'm going to read to you what it said, and they, it was always referred to by everyone as Daddy. Daddy was never sick a day in his life until this Monday morning when he went to Coastal Hospital and met the newest member of their medical center, Dr. Sleep. Even though our beloved daddy died immediately after seeing Dr. Sleep, we know that he tried, he and the nurses tried their hardest, and we wish to thank them and to welcome Dr. Sleep to our community. Well, that was the beginning of the week. <laughs> Let me tell you how the week ended. Every hospital 
has a beloved nurse. Everyone. Somehow the Lord sends every hospital one of these nurses. And this hospital's nurse, beloved nurse, was named Joanne. And she was up on the floor, moving, uh, helping to move a patient, not even her own patient. And uh, her finger was smashed between the bed and the wall. And she came down, and she had something that's called a subungual hematoma. That's doctor speak for a blood under the fingernail. Now, if you get a, it's a bruise, really, and if you get one anywhere else on your body, it's no big deal. It's not painful. But the blood has nowhere to expand under the fingernail. And if you've ever smashed your finger with a hammer or something like this, you know how painful it is. And what you do to treat it is to make a hole in the fingernail. Now, I had been trained how to do this with a little drill with a burr bit on it. But they didn't have those in this new hospital I was just working in. They had electric cautery units, a little electric cautery pen. And I thought, well, I, I hate the thought of sticking that hot pen through uh, her nail. I'll numb it up with a little ethyl chloride. Now, ethyl chloride is a spray that you spray on, and it's highly volatile. It evaporates so quickly that it cools the finger right off, and it's not allowed in hospitals anymore. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to tell you why, because I didn't get it all off of her hand, and I set her on fire. When you've killed the town patriarch <laughs> and you've managed to set the hospital's favorite nurse on fire, in your first week, the word spreads <laughs> real fast. <clears throat> and so my first of seven lessons to you is no matter how rough your beginning, how bad the first week is or your first appointment or job, Keep the faith. It will get better. I think of Christ. And that's what it's all about. Christ. And I think of Him in His final examination before He began His ministry. And no matter how bad your, your committee was or writing that last paper, He really did have to face the devil. <laughs> and we have a record of his first time in ministry in Luke 4. And I jotted down the six points that he made. Preach the gospel to the poor. Heal the brokenhearted. Deliver the captives. Recovery of sight. Set at liberty those who are bruised and preach the acceptable year of the Lord, the Jubilee year, the Sabbath, the mother of all Sabbaths. And what was the reaction to his first week in ministry? They took him to the edge of the cliff and tried to throw him off. If that's what they try to do to you, you're in good company. Some of you are going to be going to congregations that have prayed for you or jobs where they've been praying for you, and some of you are going to meet Philistines. No matter what, keep the faith. Preach the gospel to the poor. Heal the brokenhearted. Set captives free from sin and addiction. Give sight to the spiritually blind. Liberate the press and keep the Sabbath. Ministry and spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ is the most important work on the planet. If I got it wrong as a doctor, no big deal. All that happened was that somebody died. <laughs> but if we get the good news wrong, the consequences are no laughing matter. Lesson number two. Be generous. Work at developing a generous spirit. 
God loves a cheerful giver. Buy the pizza. Leave the change in the soda machine. Send a check, not a tuition check, but a donation check to your alma mater. Do you know what alma mater means? Your other mother. And good has helped the ratio. Be generous. I recall a patient coming into the emergency department who was terminally ill from cancer. And he got on the phone with his real estate agent. And he was upset. Uh, the realtor was trying to sell his house. A young couple wanted to buy it. They were a couple thousand dollars short. And he was upset with the realtor for trying to talk him down. And he said, what do you think I'm, trying, I'm going to do, give my house away? Within a few hours, he was dead. And they asked me to come and sign the death certificate. And I did that, and I said, is there any family I could call? And they said, no, he has no family and no friends. Imagine having only hours to live and not just giving the house away. Medicine taught me that none of us knows when we have just a few hours to live. Jesus said, I come quickly. Be generous. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Tip number three, invest in friendships. I worry that with the pace of life increasing and the ease with which we can establish uh, electronic connections to other people, that true friendship is becoming a rare thing. Good friends are a treasure from the Lord. They are something to be prayed for, worked for, and nourish. Avoid scoffers. Avoid cynics. Choose your friends carefully. Choose ones that build you up and sharpen your faith. As Paul says, do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. I just lost a dear friend this past winter who taught me many things and many others about friendship. It was Dr. J. Ellsworth Callis. He called me nine years ago um, out of the blue. He was the president of Asbury Seminary. And he extended the hand of friendship to me. And for years and years and years, we got together every three to four weeks for a two hour lunch. During the last year, he lost his health. He was 83 when he first called me. And during the last year, he lost his health. And we would sit together and pray and read scripture, and he would sing hymns to me. Imagine a friend that'll sing hymns to you. He died at age 92. Now many of us would say, why bother making a new friend when you're 83? But friendships are like trees. The best time to have planted one is 50 years ago. But the second best time is today. I like to think of the friendship that Jesus had with Lazarus. The friendship that he had with John. So comfortable he would lay his head on his chest. Jesus said that there is no greater love than that we have friends we are willing to give our lives for. Invest in your friendship, and the most precious friendship you can have is a husband or wife, and mine is Nancy, who's here with me today. Tip number four, let the Bible teach you. So many of us want to instruct God instead of letting Him teach us. God left us a book to believe in. Believe in it. Now, I had never read the Bible until I was in my mid-40s. 
and my family was going through a hard time, and my wife's brother had drowned in front of my children, and a lot of other bad things had happened. And I saw a book in a waiting room, and I picked it up, and I realized it was a Bible, and that I had never read it. And I realized I didn't have one at home, and so I stole it. <laughs> started teaching me, I met the Lord. Up until that point in my life, I'd been like a broken sailboat out on the ocean, in the midst of the ocean at night. But with the Bible, things changed. Life is still like the ocean. It's big, and it's unpredictable, and it can change at any moment. But with the Bible, it's like having a compass and a rudder and a chart. You know where you're going. Let the Bible teach you. I have found that it is a, a, an interesting exercise and an edifying one to, if you have a particular question, to start in Genesis and read the entire way through Scripture and ask it a question, and it will answer for you. I did that, and that's where the, the Green Bible that Dr. Lattimore mentioned came from, that I did, uh, I was the general editor on, and Desmond Tutu did the forward, and I did the introduction, the Pope did the next essay. You might even beat the Pope out if you read through the whole Bible. Number five, be thankful. Give thanks in all circumstances for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Now I was a bit cynical as a doctor. I was a doctor and I wasn't a Christian. And that's really a recipe for becoming a bit cynical. It's hard not to become cynical when you work with people who you are trying to make better and they are hell-bent on making themselves worse. In short, to do the kind of work that all of you are going out to do. Um, and one way I found that the Lord began working on me and He changed my cynicism was to make a gratitude journal. Now I began writing the things I was grateful for. When you really start, it's amazing what will make it to the list. A piece of dental floss if you just eat popcorn wrong is a miracle, you know? <laughs> Refrigeration, antibiotics, automobiles and phones. Now these are just little things. The kind of things that James Walker Hood had never even seen when he started this institution. They're far from the, the big things to be grateful for. Things like love and friendship, the Bible, forgiveness of our sins, our wives and husbands, mothers, fathers, and children. And one I'm about ready to get thankful for, grandchildren. <laughs> yes, you, you can clap for grandchildren. Um, now, my gratitude journal has worked over the years, and it's become a miracle journal. Every day I look for a miracle. Do you know what happens when you look for a miracle every single day? You see one. Be grateful and look for miracles. Number six, remember the Sabbath. Sabbath is the real estate in time that God granted to the church to operate on. And we are getting to be such a busy people that we're forgetting to renew the lease. Sabbath keeping is not a condition of getting into heaven, but it is the condition that heaven is in if you get there. And we are told to bring this earth to be like heaven. The only person who ever announces himself to God as busy is in the beginning of the book of Job, 
And he says, I am going up and down, to and fro. If you do not stop and take your hands off the wheel one day a week, you'll get to thinking that you're driving the car. But it's Jesus Christ who's at the wheel. I, I can go on and on about Sabbath. Invite me to your church to do it. But you don't want me to do it today. But I have found that in my own personal life and faith, that it is indispensable to give the Lord the first day of the week. And the last is like the beautiful song that we heard. Pray. I forget to pray sometimes. Maybe it's because I started being a Christian late. But it's odd how many times things are going wrong. And I'm so stupid I've forgotten to pray. I've never mentioned a movie, I don't think, from a pulpit. But are you familiar with The War Room? Yes. I was so inspired by that movie that I took a 5x5 five five closet and I've turned it into a prayer closet. I spent seven years before I went to undergraduate school being a carpenter. Man, you should come see my prayer closet. <laughs> I just finished it. It smells like paint and prayers already. You don't have to have a closet to pray in, but you need to pray. When we work, we work. But when we pray, God works. Pray without ceasing, and I'll tell you just an insight I had on prayer. I had traveled to a church because sometimes we pray and we don't get an answer, right? And I had traveled to a church in Ohio, and I was there to preach on Sunday morning, but Saturday evening they had a dinner, and they had invited me, and they would invited me to say a few words, and there was a big crowd. And uh, a young man came over to me, and everybody scattered. This was the difficult parishioner. And he sat down and he ate with me. And uh, I, it's not correct to say this, but I think the way to describe him was the village idiot. And he sat in front of me and he kept telling me a story over and over and over again. And I kept saying, I understand, I understand. He said, no, you don't understand. And he would tell me the exact same story over again. And then I felt the presence of the Lord saying, Matthew, what do you think you look like in front of me? <clears throat> so pray without ceasing. And I am going to do that right now. Let us bow our heads and I will pray for each and every one of you. Dear Heavenly Father, oh, thank you for letting us be your children. Thank you for letting us all be brothers and sisters. And you looking on us today, proud of these men and women who have trained so hard, the teachers that have worked so hard and diligently to get us here today so that more workers might go into the field. Be with these men and women let them have a smoother first week than I had. And if not, let them know that they are loved and to keep the faith. Bless their parents and their spouses and children who've done so much to support them and get them here. Shower them with love and affection and make them count for a world that's increasingly sometimes harder to see you make them shine as brighter lights, a reflection of your light, which is never overcome by darkness. And now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. 
May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Jesus Christ, his Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.